economy. His name is Paul Hoffer, director of Caltech, past president or chairman of the Ontario Arts Association, and now uh, author of The Bagel Effect, but more than that in terms of what we have. The Bagel Effect, he, we will have a chance to say a few words about in You Should Hear, you will love it. Uh, but he also uh, is, uh, for the moment, experimenting with the first community that is wide online uh, and in a large bandwidth of about 300 households and studying it, called Intercom Ontario, which is quite a project. So Lighthouse, that, Derek. Sorry? Lighthouse. Very interesting, Lighthouse. Derek. Really nice to meet you, Paul. Nice to meet you. And, uh, oh, and we have the visit of, let me just quickly focus on him. It's fun. This time, the technology is being nice with me. This is Peter Euterlinden, your consul of, of the Netherlands in Toronto. Hello, Peter. <laughs> Can you come a little closer, perhaps? Yeah, you Oh, <laughs> so what we should do, I'm glad nobody saw that, the uh, camera was, <laughs> was out. Let me uh, bring you back in the picture. Right. So we, I think we, sh we should, not, I'm not real, absolutely everybody, but when people come in, we will present them. Perhaps because okay, Derek. we don't want to have one of those very sort of overly formal kind of thing. So how about your side? Okay. First of all, let me ask you a question. Your picture is very good. Yes. The sound is still not perfect, but the picture is good. Can you see our picture good? Yes, but you are lit in such a way that you are all speaking out of the darkness <laughs> rather than the light. <laughs> This is Amsterdam from the Dark Ages. <laughs> no. Well, if you could ask somebody, to, if you could ask somebody to put a forward light, that's all is needed. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey, is it becoming, is it becoming a little better now? I think I'm now beginning to recognize you, indeed. You are indeed very <laughs> becoming. Actually, I was in disguise today, but let me um, introduce some of the people on our side. Great. First of all. I need to uh, uh, introduce some people of the LCI company because they are the ones that when Derek, Robert, Rick, Nancy, Sylvia and I decided that we'd link up with you actually worked the last few days, day and night, as Robert knows, to get this connection going and I'm very, very grateful to them indeed. So there's Maria um, uh, from uh, LCI and Errol uh, who has helped us set it all up. So, uh, but in our room, um, on my <laughs> left-hand side, Elsa. you will see Elseline Smith. Elseline is from uh, Brace International Consultancy, and she's all also worked with Robert in the past when he uh, did a Connected Intelligence workshop, and uh, it is much fun working with her, as you will uh, experience today. Um, and further to my left, to your right is Andres Selman. He, he is with the University of Amsterdam also, and he's from the Science and Technology Dynamics Department. Okay. Can you follow all that? Totally. Yeah. We are very interested. We, we are okay. saying silent hellos to Andres <laughs> and to Elsa. Okay. No. Hello, Derek. <laughs> As you know, Derek, I'm the director of a newborn, which is uh, the Anton Dreisman Institute, and it was born on the 7th of May this year, covering the uh, interesting areas of infopreneurship, how to be an entrepreneur in the information age, using information as an ingredient and information and communication technology as a tool. And we're a newborn, and first of all, we'd like to congratulate you with your 30th anniversary. So hey. we have a newborn and a 30-year-old. Congratulations. <laughs> well, that is lovely. <laughs> well, that is really won wonderful to uh, give us this attention. Go ahead. Okay. Now we have some more people uh, in the room, um, like one fellow who you might see on the background running around. His name is Boss. And Rob Robert will explain to you uh, boss, why not come in front of the camera? Uh, 
Ah. He's our technical support man, and everything he touches will work. Everything I touch will stop working. I, <laughs> so I, we're a team. That sounds familiar, but I must tell you that I, we are very grateful for the work you put into this because we have so much fear about this technology. Every time we try it, we, you know. Anyway, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, but congratulations to, the, to your support. Okay. Uh, let's live dangerously, shall we? Absolutely. Um, we have... Um, um, Caroline Navignon, she's standing there near the post. I don't know if you can see her. <laughs> Not a, what's happening? We just lost your picture. So I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> anyway, go, go ahead. She's and they're expanding it's rapidly. Fine. Uh, we have Marco, you already met. There is Nancy, who is uh, office manager to Rick Maas, Professor Rick Maas, whom you met, Derek. Yes, I know. Uh, and our partner, our business partner, Mr. De B. René, he's arrived too. So uh, how about uh, showing your... I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, that's René. And of course, Sylvie, she's hiding behind my back. <laughs> so uh, obviously you can see her now. Yes, hi, Sylvie. So there might be some... And Marlise, Marlise, who's holding the Pepsi, she's making uh, advertisements for Pepsi Cola, uh, and she's our customer care officer, just like uh, Sylvia is. Okay. Great. So we have a young and bright team here. And Over to you, Derek. Well, we have a growing, um, and I think we, uh, generally young and <laughs> and good team here too. Uh, so, I would like to say two minutes yes. because I have to leave for a lecture at nine. Oh, you have to. I want to say mm. something. Okay, well, uh, Bob Logan here. I have to Come give up. I have to give a lecture at nine o'clock, so I'm going to have to leave. However, I will be replaced by someone far better than me, my partner, Margaret Logan. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to say a couple of things about infopreneurship. Uh, on our yes. side here at the uh, festival, on Tuesday and Thursday, we will be having uh, workshops on knowledge management and connected right. intelligence. Uh, we will be graced with the presence of Carl Eric Svebe, who will yes. be running two, two, two workshops. The first one is called Apples and Oranges, which is a business simulation. And then on uh, Thursday, we're going to be exploring the new Gutenberg Galaxy. Our thesis is that the uh, internet is, is strong or as big a revolution as the Gutenberg press and that uh, the ways of changing business will uh, evolve because of this new technology. And so uh, the, oh. the work that we're doing is, is parallel and it's a great pleasure that we can join forces together in this wonderful way and I look forward to other interactions with you. Okay. Well, uh, we uh, have to, um, and sorry that you have to leave, but we'll, uh, through Derek and through uh, Robert, we'll keep in close contact with you. Well, through, e interested. through yes. email, mm -hmm. I will bombard you with information. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank <do>. you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Perhaps we should uh, proceed because of the number of things that we have to uh, cover, uh, and then we will do introduction as, they, as people come into the focus, if that's okay with you. Yes, Derek, that's, uh, that's fine. As from the congratulations, uh, I want to move on to uh, enjoyment. And uh, uh, we'd actually like to proceed and within like two or three minutes uh, do our presentation. Okay. Is that, is that okay? Okay, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Now, we, uh, uh, as we said, had two workshops to prepare ourselves. Uh, and that was, uh, that was fun. It, uh, it was a lot of enjoyment to us. And Robert, uh, uh, luckily he was present so he can explain in person how much fun it was. Um, the type of people that were there were people from government, there were people from multimedia new companies, there were people from the University of Amsterdam present, technical oriented people, um, people from uh, uh, automation uh, companies with very large facilities like Rene de B is presenting uh, and also um, uh, 
my uh, consultants uh, were present, and um, we were all unanimous that by bringing, and the McLuhan program did that, by bringing these uh, people together, only the act of doing so was already a deed of connected intelligence. Well. So that, we did some preparation beforehand, and not everybody could be here today. Okay? That's wonderful. <laughs> From enjoyment, we go to excitement. <laughs> <laughs> We're excited to be online with you. And uh, we actually are ready to do our PowerPoint presentation uh, with you if uh, Robert is ready too. Ready. Robert, are you... Um... I'm getting ready now. <laughs> <laughs> and I think by now, you probably will have heard enough of my voice. So the opening of our PowerPoint presentation will be taken care of by El Celine. Great. <laughs> Hello, Derek. Hi, El Celine. You are oh, our yeah, favorite yeah. presenter. <laughs> Thank you very much. I feel flattered. I want to give you a short overview of what happened during these two evenings. Uh, the first evening, uh, we divided ourselves in three groups, and we discussed the three questions you formulated. I have to say the discussions were so, we were discussing so hard, and we got so excited that we completely forgot to divide any roles, like who is the shaker, who is the mover. So we were not moving at all in the sense you would like us to move, but there was a lot of movement within the groups, and we really had the feeling to be uh, working on connected intelligence nevertheless. Uh, the second evening, we selected one subject, uh -huh. and that was the question uh, related to uh, work opportunities in networking environments. And this evening, we worked in two groups. And well, just to give you an impression, I want to tell you something about uh, the group in which I work myself. We first started with a brainstorm session about uh, identifying variables or factors which must be met to um, make have to be able to make business in the next five or ten years. Well, we came up with a very long list of maybe 30 or 35 different uh, concepts. Well, to reduce this number of concepts, we uh, searched for some basic rules which that we could find in this long list, also to make it more easy to handle this list of uh, concepts. Name? Well, finally, we came up with four uh, basic rules, and we will introduce you in that uh, later. And um, with the other uh, variables we identified, uh, we defined uh, dimensions which we allocated to these four basic rules. Unfortunately, one evening was really too short to work out these dimensions or to work out these basic rules. So, well, we hope to do that in the near future. But we hope to give you an impression, anyway, of what were the results of this evening. Wonderful. You know that I wouldn't be concerned too much over the question of having not completed everything the way you feel like it. The whole idea is to do it over time as well with different groups of people. It's, a, it's really a new version of, of connected intelligence. So we'll get there. Okay. Okay. Uh, really, we would like the McLuhan program to continue for another 100 years at least. <laughs> hey! We really yeah. need that time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, El Celine. Uh, actually, we, we'd like the second slide, Robert, if you would. Now I'm going to take that one out. And Andres uh, will address, maybe, maybe we address uh, one of the uh, postcards there. <laughs> okay, can we have the second slide, uh, Robert? We have the second slide. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have your face. <laughs> you got a full screen second slide. Okay. Oh, there we go. That is actually wonderful. Andres, there you go. Okay, yeah, like uh, Thomas said, I'd like to introduce uh, not one, but, but two, in fact, two of the variables that we discussed in the uh, workshops. <clears throat> the first one of uh, importance uh, uh, that, I w that I wish to cover is a knowledge worker filter that you see on the, uh, on the PowerPoint presentation screen there. Um, <clears throat> now, the way I see it is that uh, currently we're experiencing an exponential growth in the amount of information that we're dealing with, and uh, as our old books that we've uh, written and uh, sound bites that we've recorded and so on become more increasingly available online, we have more and more information that we need to filter through, 
and so the position of knowledge worker information filter becomes more and more important as we move into into this electronic age and I also want to clarify that when we were discussing the idea of a filter we're not necessarily talking about an individual human filter or someone who works for an organization this could also mean an intelligent agent where we have we have a computer program that allows us that runs on an algorithm or something that allows us to make certain selections as to what kind of information should be should be coming in what kind of information should be filtered out a good example of that would be our our email communication where you can set up your email to to reject some messages and accept others so this is one issue that are one variable rather that we discussed in the workshops the second one that I'm going to introduce is a virtual identity structure versus real identity this is somehow linked with the knowledge worker filter issue that I just discussed what I want to push towards or what I want to get at is how the nature of identity is changing with electronic culture and this is well documented in the medium theory literature with uh, McLuhan and Ong and Merowitz and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the issue uh, then for business is how, how, do, how does one select how to portray oneself online because one can do so um, and whether or not this is in fact a position where someone could be hired to, to create images for people in, uh, in some kind of business environment online in the future. Uh, this is sort of a PR work type thing. And then, and then uh, tied with this or coupled with this is the notion of uh, uh, individual identity or real identity as opposed to this virtual identity. And what happens with that as we, increasing, as we increase the amount of virtual identities that one individual can have, uh, what happens to uh, the previous notion, so a structuralist notion of, a, of an individual identity that, that, uh, that is whole and complete uh, and isolated unto itself. Um, and again, this is well documented by Burks, by uh, Merowitz, and Poster, and so on. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. This is just uh, another variable or another issue that, that uh, was brought up in the workshops and stimulated a lot of discussion. I can imagine. Well, uh, these are just uh, two of the examples of discussions we had. I move uh, forward to the self-satisfying worker. We had a, an in a discussion on it that <laughs> in future we feel... Uh, and I didn't pick the picture. It was Robert who did. <laughs> <laughs> it was Marco Polo. <laughs> very nice picture uh, by Fischl. <laughs> you're, you're too far away for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we feel that um, you know the issue of where you know the current mode of thinking still is that companies are providing goods or services or even current uh, uh, literature is describing the experience uh, economy you know uh, thinking out of the the, the state of uh, providing services and experience to somebody we we feel with the generic infrastructure such as we have discussed earlier it would be possible for an individual to um, go online uh, in self-satisfying pro processing and actually uh, the uh, steering of the consumer would be more than ever consumer driven and actually uh, y you can then uh, choose and seek the satisfaction you as an individual would want um, so that's one uh, notion um, another one and uh, professor de Bucker, who is uh, teaching in our postdoctoral courses he's talking about that the information economy is actually reshaping our role uh, our roles in terms of um, there are roles uh, for authors those who are providing content those who are uh, facility providers service providers and actually we, we would like to look within our discussion with the McLuhan program to the various roles that uh, come about in the future but at the same time we are thinking that it's not the role itself but it's the connection between one role and the other and the tension and the deliverance of value between those two uh, roles or uh, two, three, or many roles, the nodes uh, are more important uh, than the roles uh, individually. Um, in fact, in one of our discussions, um, uh, somebody from our government, uh, Mr. Bert Mulder, he said, there will only be an exchange of value between individuals or computers or computers and individuals if there is such a thing as a difference between those uh, two uh, parties. And uh, so there can be transmission of something uh, between those. So 
So we feel that roles and notes have a, a great deal to do with that. And, and also with identity, I guess. <coughs> and with identity. Mm -hmm. what, what, what we don't know yet, Derek, is we made, for that reason, we said we make postcards. We know that all these notions are part of a family of postcards, but we don't know yet how they, inter how they interconnect. So, You're yes. Waiting your reaction. Yeah. <laughs> the reaction is that they, in fact, connect. Through your explanation, they are beginning to interconnect in a very strong way. I, I find maybe we could explore um, the worker-citizen business a little bit as well, since it's there. Is that OK? Yes. OK. So on, um, your end, on your end, what did you find is the, the new relationship? The new, new relationship between the self-satisfying worker and the self-satisfying citizen that we should be aware that a lot of work is going to be done by the consumer itself. So okay. if you talk about employment, mm -hmm. it's uh, the self-satisfying worker or the self-satisfying citizen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's actually, actually the, the production, production. And, that was good. and the consumption. I hear an echo. Um, the production and the consumption of whatever this consumer is taking to himself is happening at the same time. Uh, but um, uh, uh, technically, uh, the self-satisfying consumer is in control, almost 98 to 100 percent in control of consumption. Misha uh, here would like to, to uh, comment. Misha Sivan is from Ernst & Young and uh, partner at Ernst & Young in Toronto. Uh, I would like to suggest a change in, in terms here. I think it's self-fulfilling more than self-satisfying. Satisfaction implies uh, sort of a fulfilling of uh, enjoyment. I think self-fulfilling of uh, worker or citizen desires would be more uh, accurate here. Okay. We will not disagree with that. We will, we will list the word self-fulfillment uh, there. Yes. We mean the same. Okay. You know, and fulfillment is probably broader than just seeking satisfaction. Although I'm a marketing person, and I think uh, the uh, behavior of people is often triggered by very basic uh, 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 urges, as we will point out later. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, Derek, it, perhaps it's best if we complete our presentation and then have a broader and open discussion that my colleagues can partake as well. Okay, perfect. Yes. So I'd like to move to the next sheets and actually try and complete our presentation within the next seven minutes. Okay? Yes. Uh, so how about Elseline? Would you okay. care to explain why work? Why work? Well, we see an erosion of the separation between work and leisure. And that's in, separate, um, in time, but also in place. Information technology allows us to work at home, but also to have contact with the rest of the world yeah. from our working yeah, place. In our group, we discovered that this uh, erosion is going so far that we have hardly any empty time anymore, as we said. We have working hours, we have leisure, but both are usually planned full with activities. We have hardly any empty time, which we define as time which is not planned. And we see that as something to worry about. Thank you, uh, Elseline. Uh, actually, we agreed uh, very much with uh, the, the, the postcard, Why Work? And uh, I think we'll have to make a, a postcard uh, for the Institute and post it on all the walls in, uh, in Amsterdam. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> um, on the same um, uh, PowerPoint sheet, uh, we talk uh, about management of diversity and complexity. And this was discussed in, uh, in our groups, uh, uh, not at length, but uh, within a short time in depth. And actually, I think there's a lot of employment opportunities there. Let's ponder on the, uh, on the issue of diversity. Um, uh, many cultures, many people of many races, many religions, male, female, old and young, this is all called diversity issues within KPMG, Morat Ernst & Young Consultants as to how to deal with uh, a culture with this complexity of many cultures working together and how do you manage di uh, diversity. Now let's ponder on an example. 
Let's assume that I'm a housewife. I'm 35 years of age and I'm well educated. I chose to have children at age 30. I have two. They are uh, at kindergarten at age five, uh, but I don't want to uh, uh, have them raised by somebody else. So I'm working at home. Uh, I can contribute. I can be online. Uh, I am a lawyer and I can be uh, uh, given a time slot to give online consultancy on all kinds of uh, 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 legal issues and I have my time slot as if and when, as a housewife, I want to combine that with raising my children. This is one way of uh, uh, being in a diversified world where contributions can be made based on this new uh, 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 open infrastructure that we're already having, but not uh, used to uh, using. Same with elderly people. In our country, in the Netherlands, only 25% of 50 years and over are working. And this is why I say why work, because I'm uh, uh, 50, so uh, three of my age group are not working. Well, isn't that a waste of energy? Could that, that not be turned around to where we use the energy of those 50 years and over? And maybe it's not work in the sense of uh, paid work, but it might be in the sense of one of my colleagues. He is uh, um, a pensioner, and he's uh, flown uh, last week to the Caribbean to help set up a hotel school. You know, isn't that also a contribution, unpaid work to society? How can we manage diversity and get all those that have energy, talent, connected through the uh, uh, generic infrastructure, uh, which we call uh, internet or otherwise, and have this diversity help our world? Okay, I hope you have tears in your eyes by now. <laughs> Actually, the two uh, postcards, they're just there for fun, because um, actually one picture, I don't know whether that's a tent or somebody's bottom. Um, <laughs> I did like the female. That, that was uh, a, a thought they, that they, they were picked by Robert. <laughs> but fragmentation and cohesion and scatter and gather, I think they are, you know, if, if you're wanting to make money, um, you know, I think it's uh, an, an infopreneur of the future will have to understand these notions as to, you know, maybe uh, get 100,000 scattered ideas and then try and gather them again and try and create value out of them, just as what we are doing at, at present. And I feel that there will be a world of fragmentation, like individual employed people, people working in small units, but there will also be room for large institutions or communities where people will find cohesion. So there will be two ways uh, of existence, fragmented and, um, you know, like in groups and gathered uh, issues. But we, we need to understand that, you know, in the past we probably were only seeking cohesion. We were only trying to gather. We were thinking in terms of rock logic and we uh, uh, didn't let go into the world of liquid logic. Mm -hmm. And we should let go more often than hold. Okay. This is pretty cool. <laughs> we are turning to our next sheet to complete our presentation in the next three minutes. How are we doing? We we're doing fine. Can you... Yeah. Uh, would you be kind enough? To speed up a little bit, I will tell, talk about peace and quiet. <laughs> we live on high speed, workload increases, and also in our private life, we are running from one activity to another. Many people have the feeling that we are lived, and in fact, we don't want to be lived. So there is an increasing need for peace and quiet, not only to be quiet, but also to find some time for reflection and to don't run only forward, but also to look back or to, do, to look around where we are and where we want to go from there. Okay. I will also um, elaborate a little bit on the postcards of translation of cultures. In our global economy, uh, an important point of attention is cultures and differences between cultures and the translations which are necessary to bring cultures together. Translation in the literal sense of the word, by means of translating from one language to the other, or from one symbol system to another symbol system, but also translation of meaning, taking into account cultural differences. 
Okay. Actually, each one of these postcards could fill one evening of uh, discussion, um, preferably with a brandy in an open fireplace. No reaction? No, we don't. We didn't want to interrupt you because the last time we okay. did that, it seemed that we had taken a lot of the time. But no, of course there is okay. reaction. Every one of these things is a great, a very strong suggestion. I would have a, a perhaps if if the job strategy is a, what we have in mind, I would like to expand on that with our both sides, uh, talking about in which of these areas what kind of new jobs appear and how do you promote them. That would be a bit my my approach to. These areas are all rich domains of, of development, and that means instead of just losing all the jobs in traditional situation, we actually can transfer and start thinking about new areas of development. That's, that's what I have That's right. Well, mm -hmm. the interesting part is we let our uh, discussion flow, and we found with these postcards, in hindsight, that we weren't discussing jobs like the cleaner, the painter, the doctor, and the sister, mm -hmm. and the teacher. We were actually... Uh, on a more abstract level, but we'll come to that in just one second after this commercial message. <laughs> <laughs> Andres, will you go into identity? Uh... Oh, I didn't realize it was working. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> well, first, uh, Derek, could you see to uh, getting the visuals back? We can't see you here. Uh oh. We would like to see. I'm you. sorry. Is how about that? Uh, Change camera. Not yet. Change the camera. How do I change the camera? Which, which, uh, oh, this way, you mean. Uh, no. Main camera, far end. Uh, that's great. That's um, it. Okay, the final postcard that I would look at, uh, and that was discussed in the workshops, is identity versus collective. Um, I'm not so sure exactly what to say about this, but it, 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 ties, in, it ties in quite well with the, the idea of uh, virtual identity structure that I was discussing just a few minutes ago where we can see uh, the electronic age is somehow changing our notions of identity. Um, and I think this, this changes our whole notion about how we act, act collectively as well. In, uh, when, when we talk about uh, electronic uh, or, or connected intelligence, we can, think, um, we can think about the changing nature of democracy um, or online, online membership to different groups, be it Greenpeace, be it uh, be, you know, what have you, and, and uh, transnational. Uh, movements are, are being facilitated by this kind of by this kind of uh, connectivity. So I think uh, the overall gist is that the electronic age is changing our very notion of what an individual identity is, and at the same time, is changing a notion of what it is that that constitutes our collective identity. You know, where are we pushing towards in the future? I'll leave that done. Okay. Yeah. Um, next sheet, uh, please, Robert. Um, you, so you can see our postcards are you know, more or less leading uh, uh, to an abstract way of thinking. They're thinking, uh, if you look at, at, at these postcards uh, about uh, business, about enterprise, about employment, it has become more or less an ab abstract conceptual architecture rather than a very concrete architecture like job descriptions, uh, uh, etc. laying down what work should be done in what time. Um, and all we know is that uh, these postcards are interesting enough to to uh, to uh, study and also what they mean uh, between each postcard and on the nodes of uh, new roles to be defined. We feel that there, where there is energy, there, that there where is a flow and transaction, there will be employment uh, and also value to be added. Um, so El Samik will uh, conclude with uh, about seven. Uh, dimensions that we feel are worth uh, at this point as a deliverable, first deliverable in our uh, discussion with you. And that's our last uh, uh, sheet. And we think that uh, there will be work for people who understand these dimensions, who understand the difference between the dimensions and the characteristics of the dimensions. I will explain them very shortly because we have just a few minutes of time the first one, to make sense, which has to do with content, with context, with history, with future, with generating meaning. And who doesn't understand how to make sense will result in nonsense or complete confusion, which is an undesired situation. Trust has to do with reputation, accountability, responsibility, which we found actually some key issues for success. 
If there is no trust, there will be distrust, and in the worst case, even violence. Flow, or dynamics, is an important element. Flow is not enough in itself. There, have, there must also be moments of hold, moments of reflection, moments to keep ourselves a, a mirror to see where we are and where we want to go. We have to take care of communities, the public space, the public infrastructure, but also at the same time, we have to make sure to take care for the individual and the identity. We have to think about work in the traditional meaning, which has to do with, uh, well, you have to earn money, you have to work to earn money, you have to do your duty. But there is also work in the future. Is it still work? Do we want to use the word work if we are doing the things we like to do, if, we are, if work and leisure are combined? And we have to do with the knowledge worker, and the knowledge worker will only be successful if he's able to deal with complexity. And finally, we are talking a lot about knowledge and we need more knowledge and more knowledge services. But knowledge alone uh, has no right to exist. We also need intuition to succeed. Well, this wow. was our uh, uh, contribution from the teamwork, uh, uh, mo many of them sitting behind us. Wow. And uh, Elsa, uh, <laughs> Elsa Lee and Andres and I were just spokespeople uh, for them. Uh, but we are int very much interested in your uh, uh, early feedback. Absolutely, and that's the time now. We, um, I hope I get this right. I send you the uh, main camera. We'll have, yeah, we can see you now, and we're sending you this image, I hope. Um, I would like very much to uh, ask the audience, I've been talking a lot. Now, to do this, if you, if you don't mind, we'll have a little ritual. I'm going to have, it's unfortunately, we, we don't have a... Uh, microphone system that works throughout the whole room in the same way. So you'll have to do as you would in a, in a conference, come up to the microphone, so to speak. So, Paul, can you come and then that way you can be seen. So, uh, Paul Levinson would like to say a few words, I think, about the... Uh, well, I, I, I was... Uh, no, I, I've been introduced already. Um, I was especially interested in uh, one of the opening postcards uh, on the question of, of online identity. Um, in our online classes over the last decade, uh, the question has frequently arisen, how do we know who the students are uh, as they're taking courses? For example, how can we tell if, uh, if it's a student uh, who's signing on one week uh, and next week it's the student's friend masquerading as uh, under his identity or the student's father or grandfather or grandmother for that matter? And what we found, uh, however, and I think this is good news, is that there is uh, something in everyone's writing style, which is not that apparent, uh, you know, unless you write letters to someone. Uh, it's not that apparent in most traditional courses in which a student just hands in one or two papers over the course of, of a term. But in an online course, when the student is constantly writing, and that's the primary mode of communication, after a few days, it becomes crystal clear to the other students in the course, as well as the faculty, who that person is. And uh, we had one or two cases where, for example, uh, at the end of the term, a student submitted a paper, and it was immediately obvious that that paper was not written uh, by the person who had been entering comments in the online course throughout the term. Uh, much more clear, again, than uh, in equivalent situations uh, in in-person classes where you don't get to know the student through writing. So what that suggests to me is that there are, in effect, compensations in online transactions through which we can ascertain people's identities, through which people uh, establish their identities, that in their own way are just as effective as seeing people. And even though you can't see the person's face or hear the person's voice in a purely text situation, you get to know an aspect of their personality and writing style in a way that you couldn't uh, in a traditional class. Right. I'm, sh I'm sure that you do need then uh, a tutor uh, to cover like uh, 20, 30 students, and you have to more or less get to know their pattern and not change your tutors too often. That's right, and even 20, 30 students is pushing it. 
Uh, usually a, an online class works best with perhaps 10 or 15 students at most. Right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, thanks, Paul. That's going to be um, any um, commentary on, comment on the, on the photo, anything you feel that you could suggest in any direction? Yeah? Miss Jeffrey? Um, Executive Producer and Associate Director of the McLuhan Program. This is Liz Jeffrey. Hi, and hello, hello in particular. Yes. Elsa Lien, hello. I was over there hello. at your Building Public Space Online uh, excellently organized connected intelligence workshop. So good morning, everybody. <coughs> good morning, good our morning. time anyway. <laughs> I'd like to recommend, first of all, that uh, anybody who hasn't read Manuel Castell's work, that's C-A-S-T-E-L-L-S, -L -L uh, please do so. He has a trilogy out on the information age, and it is quite marvelous work that I think touches upon all the issues we are busy discussing today. The great value in Castell's work is not only has he absorbed McLuhan deeply, but Castell's grasps a global perspective and works with people in diverse cultures in order to make his case. He attempts to theorize some of the things we're talking about, but he always stays on the ground and tries to look at what's going on in each cultural context. So I offer that by way of uh, context and background here. I would advance a kind of approach to what we're talking about that I call visionary pragmatism. And what that means is really that we want to sketch out a type of a vision for where it is we want to go or what it is we see that, that we think is important. We want to spend some time talking about the vision but at the same time, we want to make sure to stay on the ground, as it were, and advance some very practical and concrete proposals. To this end, I would suggest that listening to what you've come up with, which I find very, very uh, stimulating and inspiring, I think there are a couple of things that I would add. I think you're correct in looking at this kind of nexus of the network, the flow, community, and identity. Those are the four key terms that I'd select in what you're talking about network, flow, community, and identity. But I think we should focus a little more on the shift from large organizations in the old mechanical fashion uh, to self-employment, mobile organizations, virtual organizations. And I think that this is crucial, and it's a way of bridging some of our discussions of identity, the individual community, and the question of work. It seems to me that in this self-employment context, something that no government has managed successfully to address, and I don't think the corporations have either, is this whole business of how you provide encouragement for self-employed uh, parts of the node, for interrelations among these uh, different uh, entities, forming, unforming, virtually coming into existence, then moving along. This whole issue of how you provide for some of the securities that were once provided for people by, say, having a pension plan or access to health plans or whatever it is that sometimes induce people to go into large corporate structures, how you begin to replace some of that. At this point in time, some governments seem to regard those who are self-employed as somehow their enemies. They're, they're trying to hide their self-employed income or they're trying to get on the net and do things or they're trying to barter and thus escape whatever the local taxation system is seems to me that this attitude is very, very misguided. Instead, what we need is a brand new approach to the question of work that involves the recognition of self-employment, that involves the recognition that companies are going to come and go, and that this is a good thing, not, in fact, a bad thing. So it seems to me that we have to add and factor into the, uh, the work that you've done so far, this whole business of centralization, decentralization, these identities that are that are fixed and then unfixed in this whole notion of flow this shifting community identity and network so in the in in conclusion to these brief interjections just trying to urge us along a little further i'd say that from a visionary pragmatist perspective the vision that i think we're looking down the road to is one whereby we make it possible for all sorts of individuals even if they don't have uh, jobs in the conventional sense within um, old style structures, we have a vision of more opportunities for people being manifest in a variety of ways. And I think that pragmatically what this involves is an entirely new definition of work so that governments begin to recognize again 
that those who are out there creating opportunities and creating their own uh, enterprises are not the enemy somehow, but instead are very much to be encouraged in that all networking and all these uh, new kinds of, of identity and business models, in fact, are vital. And I think the same is true for corporations as well. I think corporations have been a lot quicker to recognize this whole, uh, this whole set of developments, partly because it's been in their interest through downsizing and whatnot. But I think that even corporations need to get to the next phase which is not only to look at trying to create anorexic enterprises, as they've been called, stripping themselves out of all the, you know, all the people and trying to offload their responsibilities, but rather to really look at this overall structure and how it may be in their interests to encourage this growth and development of these self-initiating, self-organizing um, kinds of enterprises that I'm basically referring to as self-employment. So thanks. That's my interjection for now. Thank you, Liz, and uh, nice to get to know you. Um, I'd like to confirm, Liz, that also on our side, the literature of Castells is, uh, is, is, is on the top of our list at present. Great. So we, um, you know, uh, Professor Rick Maas, whom uh, uh, Derek met, uh, actually is, a, is, is, is in favor of Castells' uh, body of literature. And it's amazing how this uh, author C combines what you expressed uh, uh, in the way of vision, but indeed, uh, through all the cultures that he's uh, seen and worked with, stays with two feet on the ground. He's a brilliant author indeed, so we agree with you, Liz, on okay, that. Okay, I'm Second delighted to hear that. He's, he's in fact just beginning to make his way through the North American scene, I'm surprised to say, but I am right. delighted. We teach him in the McLuhan Program Communications History courses, so that's good to hear. Right. I think his third book, it's about four or five hundred pages, but it's worth every uh, uh, letter. Then is the second thing, uh, is there anybody else who would like to um, uh, uh, react on the self-employment? Yes, we, we have, uh, Paul, for the, uh, on your end, do we have any a response to what uh, Liz said? Well, yes, also I'd like to confirm that Liz's statements uh, are really on the dot as far as Amsterdam is concerned. Because um, uh, in October last, and it's still October today, uh, uh, the Dutch government uh, opened a twinning uh, network which actually uh, takes captains of large industries to help young starters start uh, uh, high-tech uh, companies where this uh, responsibility for self-employment is taken seriously by the Dutch government by captains of industry. And uh, so we should talk about that uh, next time we meet, Liz. Very good. Paul Hoffer here. Hello, Paul. I'd like to follow on a little bit uh, uh, with uh, some of the uh, issues that Liz began to, um, uh, to raise. In terms of employment, what we see certainly in North America is that the concept that um, came out of the industrial revolution of dividing your life into three phases, the first one being learning, the second one being earning or working, and the third one being sort of relaxing or retiring, no longer makes any sense now that we're uh, in this uh, third revolutionary cycle uh, driven by digitization and all the rest of it. And that we understand that we need lifelong learning because uh, when a person is perhaps 40 years old, what they need to know some of it may not have been known when they were 30 years old. And the work cycle that we have is not conducive to having people stop working for two or three years and acquiring the new skills and the new knowledge that they perhaps need. Um, so that the entire way that we live and work uh, will be revolutionary, will be changed in a revolutionary manner in the next millennium as we find that we need to have something more akin to learning throughout our lifetime and also working throughout our lifetime. We also find in North America that um, uh, uh, those folks that you were talking about, uh, 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 three out of four people retiring when they're 50 years old, what we have in North America is that people, when they stop uh, their normal earning years, are going back to work. They're either doing volunteer work, many times they're just taking a second job, they're doing some consulting, they're starting their own business. And we find that students 
are working earlier. In other words, while they're going to school, more students are, are taking jobs while they're working to, uh, going to school. This is partially a, a result of the fact that the pension systems in the United States, Social Security and the Canada pension, are not seen as uh, necessarily being able to pay out the dividends that, uh, that we all had assumed they would. So at the same time as we talk about lifelong learning, we get to something more akin to lifelong earning. And that leaves us not much time for relaxing or retirement. And that's causing a lot of stress in our society with people having to learn and earn over a longer period of their lives. Um, so I just uh, leave you with that as a possible paradigm shift that we're going to have to rethink, if you will, the entire structure. Perhaps in the, uh, in the private sector, um, uh, companies will have to do something like the sabbaticals that we have at universities and, uh, and uh, let employees take time off to recharge, to relearn, and to relax. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. Uh, is there anybody here? Yes? Caroline would like to uh, 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 address a small word to you, uh, Paul. Um, I agree very much with you, but I think that um, in our talks here, and also for what I have read from Castells, I think it's very important that we uh, ask for some time of the psychology of this new person. So we talk, you know, learning, earning, uh, retirement, it's sort of, um, it's all about the things we have, are going to have to do, projecting these things into the future. Well, I actually think that um, if I see the stress in students, in people who work, but also in people who retire, in people who have to raise children, meanwhile writing uh, articles while they also nurse babies, I mean, it's really hard to combine these two things, for example. But I think the whole psychology is an um, issue of this new person that, is that we all underestimate a lot. And I would like to ask some attention to that. For that. Yeah, it's not have a, do you have a response to that, Paul? Uh, yes, I think I could make out the question, but some of us here uh, could not hear it too clearly. So we ask, would you please repeat uh, the last part of that question a little bit closer to the microphone or a little uh, uh, spoken a little more loudly? We'll do it a little closer to the microphone. Yes, please. Can you hear me now? Yep, much better. Yeah, you hear, can you hear me? Thank you, it's yeah, excellent. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask some attention for this new person, for the psychology of this new person. I think that we all, uh, with all these brainstorms and think tanks of this new society, spend a lot of time on economic models, on sociological structures, on organizational models. But I do see a big problem arising around people I know with all the stress of all the emails, the combination of work and kids in one room. I mean, the farm model, working at home, is not that ideal all the time. Um, the being self-employed means who, who will give you a compliment, who will say you did something well, who will comment to you um, in the sense you don't become this autistic thing that only you know, does jobs and goes on. So where does your whole knowledge, your experiences, be transformed into deeper knowledge, embodied knowledge? So there is a whole psychological um, transformation happening that we all have to do, but we actually hardly talk about. Okay, okay I'll let some others answer. I won't hog it, but I'll leave you with my own thoughts on that, which is uh, that we have a new context and uh, perhaps some new ways uh, that we need to deal with the psychology. But I don't, I don't personally believe we have a new person. I think the people um, that we remain... <laughs> Uh, that we change over evolutionary, evolu evolutionary and glacial time periods, um, although our context changed much more quickly. Thank you. <laughs> That's cool. Sorry, uh, so, sorry I, I really uh, don't agree. Michelle. No, I don't agree. Michelle. <laughs> no, come back, you. <laughs> <laughs> Paul. Paul. Paul, we want you back. I, I don't agree. Paul. Please, Paul. We don't agree. <laughs> come on, come back. Come on, come on. Hey, Paul. What's this interactive for? <laughs> okay, ah, take a thank shot. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I, I don't agree because if I look at how kids learn, for example, to negotiate over toys, how they learn to deal with disappointment, 
how they learn about praise, how they learn about sharing, how they learn when they do something and they achieve uh, new skills, how, it, how they get their feedback. All these feedback systems are changing in information society. So I think you are really underestimating the saying that we are this, you know, uh, Neanderthalers forever. Uh, well, that's, I that's a perspective we are I don't share. In the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> huh? what uh, that's a perspective so that I don't share. My my uh, personal feeling is that the uh, the hard wiring of the computer, so to speak, is uh, set. And that, of course, uh, in every culture and in every time, there are large uh, amounts of changes that we can see in the neural flow as a result of conditioning. This is the old nurture-nature argument. But yes, whether yes, the, the, uh, the fundamental nature of human beings uh, can change over uh, short periods of time, hundreds, thousands of years, is not something that, um, uh, that I accept. What about the fall of the Berlin Wall? The what, what do you say? I said, what about the fall of the Berlin Wall? That was a sudden change of human nature. Uh, uh, well, all I'm saying is that I think things of that nature, uh, things that uh, are at least as globally impactful as what we see today, have occurred throughout history. I mean, when the Huns came and, uh, and burned all the villages or whatever it is, if you were in one of those villages, uh, you you uh, had to deal with some uh, fairly massive change, probably larger than what we're dealing with. Okay, can today. we can talk about lonely, you know, yeah, sex and, and all those things and uh, loneliness and violence and, and winning jungle things. But I mean something else. If you look at Yugoslavia and the war that's happening there, yes, the identity that people get through media has deeply contributed to the uh, a mess, uh, uh, awful situation that people live in there. So yes. this sort of you know, so I am agreeing with the, most of what you're saying. I'm sorry. I, I, it's, uh, don't get the idea that, I'm not, uh, that I don't agree that there are massive changes as a result of media and other things. But as a result of these contexts, there are uh, certain stresses psychologically and otherwise. I, I really just, uh, not to take it too far, didn't agree with the question that we have become somehow new people and fundamentally different than our ancestors. I just think that uh, our context, the context around us, will change the way uh, we react to it. We get these uh, two cultures between uh, Paul and Caroline connected. Yes. Oh, you're out, you're out of <laughs> I think you're. I'm out of it. <laughs> I think you both. We've got a lot. I think you're both uh, meaning the same. I think you're both meaning the same and expressing it in a different way. Um, Derek. Uh, yes, no, I, Misha, I wanted to make a, watch. Misha wanted to make a comment, and then I think we could go on to the next. Uh, but I'd like, Moses, would you like to say a few words as well? <laughs> okay, so then Misha, and we'll have two more interventions. Misha uh, is going to say. I, I have uh, a comment and a question or, or request. Uh, the okay. co first of all, my, my first comment is thank you very much for your input. It was uh, great. I think you sort of exposed most of the uh, issues related to, to the situation. Um, on the question on the postcard of translation of cultures, I think it's a very interesting one. And I wanted to ask if you had um, come across a work by Fons Trompenar, uh, writing the wave of cultures. I, mean, he, I think he is very uh, clearly address uh, issues of differences in cultures in working environment in terms of uh, uh, relationship between the people with different cultural backgrounds in uh, at work yes we we know Franz uh, Trompenar uh, well and also his uh, latest book on on the subject and actually we were anticipating also to be communicating with the Japanese so we actually uh, uh, looked at his book on some of the Japanese uh, cultural differences between uh, the North Americans, the Dutch, and the Japanese. Y yes, we, we know Trompenars, yes? Good. Uh, referring to what, uh, or rather using Lisa's uh, e uh, term of visionary pragmatism, I just want to ask uh, one question 
all the issues that you identified talk about the uh, the transition, the different approach to, to people uh, and work. Uh, one issue that you have not touched upon is the issue of compensation, or rather motivation. What would motivate a knowledge worker, contribute of his or her knowledge to the community, and how do we uh, identify our traditional compensation structures are based on uh, amount of time we work. And basically, it's coming from industrial era of, of factory work where we sort of punched the clock and we were paid for a certain number of hours. Uh, unfortunately, we still, un I don't know, <laughs> unfortunately or not, but we still continue to maintain this mode of compensation because we have not come up with anything better. Uh, I have uh, difficulty in uh, sort of identifying how do I motivate or a, a knowledge worker to contribute. Obviously, they do not stop working when they leave uh, the building. Neither they uh, work when they are in the building because they may just sit around in a cubicle and, and uh, do nothing. Uh, as, as soon we start, as soon as we start dealing with creative work, with knowledge with thinking, I think we have to uh, come up with different uh, types of compensation uh, dealing around the outcomes or, or performance or some uh, something of that nature. And uh, I, I definitely would like to hear Moses Schneider's uh, ideas about it because he deals with this kind of people all the time. Uh, when, when you talk about workers' pleasure, I think you, are, you said that uh, the, the lines between work and pleasure are blurring. Uh, I would like to say it's either because uh, you see your work as pleasurable or you work so hard at your uh, you know, free time that it becomes work. But uh, again, talking about knowledge workers, I think we have to understand what is that work uh, to them and uh, how do we uh, motivate them in terms of increasing their performance. Uh, finally, I wanted to ask you to think about a pragmatic issue of translating those ideas to the everyday life of uh, business. As an uh, advisor to, to businesses, I have to tell them uh, what, when we are talking about some ideas and concepts, how those concepts will translate into the bottom line. And uh, granted, we may not uh, you know, be open to it right now because we are still in the beginning of the, of the road, of the journey, but I think we have to start thinking about how do we take this uh, to uh, the businesses that run by uh, you know, profit and loss, but run by by money, by resources, and uh, trying to uh, spend as little and make as much as they can, and how do we uh, sort of translate this into uh, business over the internet, or as everybody calls it, e-commerce now. What do we sell? I mean, obviously there are tangible versus intangible goods and services over the internet. It's difficult to, uh, to send, yes, there are you know, ways of uh, sending goods over the internet, but I think we are still, businesses are still struggling over uh, e-business, over e-commerce, or what do you do, how do we make money on the internet? Okay, that was my uh, final small comment about the role of, uh, of the government. I personally think the government should have as little role as possible in the new world. I think the, they are sort of struggling as how they are going to tax the electronic transactions in the cyberspace, and uh, I think they didn't figure it out. And for as long as they can't figure it out, I think we should be happy. <laughs> should the government role should shrink in the new world, whether we are new people or not? Those are my comments. <laughs> You're talking to Dutch people, my man, but we'll see. Uh, just hang on for a second, because we will have to do some critical decision. And the decision is this. I believe we can only handle one of these themes at a session. Tomorrow we'll present you yeah. our stuff. It's no point trying to, I'd like to continue the discussion. And in fact, I would like, if he cares to, uh, invite Canada's visionary pragmatist in television 
not only as programming, but as a whole station. This is uh, Moses Neimer. Would you like to join us? <laughs> Moses. <coughs> this is one of the greatest artists of television, uh, but you may not understand the art immediately in the same way. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, hello. 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 Let me try and respond <laughs> to your point about how uh, compensation is calculated in knowledge and media industries. Um, in my own company, except for those people who um, are still represented by unions, uh, and then essentially because of the union's insistence, uh, these people's uh, compensation is keyed to time. It's not paid per hour, but after a certain number of hours, it's expected that they would be paid some overtime. Uh, they're the only people in the company who um, are paid in that way. Uh, for, for the rest of the staff, more and more people are being compensated um, by reference to their ability to generate revenue and their contribution to the generation of profit, um, which is kind of commonplace and straightforward, but um, I like to think of those two things in turn as somehow related by the number of lives that are being touched. Um, in other words, if you're running a small local grocery store and your client base consists of uh, 100 families or 200 families and some other random people who walk through the door, no matter how brilliantly well you run that store or how innovative it is, there is a limit to the amount of revenue that you will generate. Um, at the other end of this extreme, of course, there is the artist who may only have a single patron, but uh, creates a work of such refinement and exclusivity that that patron may be willing to pay literally millions of dollars for it. But generally speaking, in the world of media, in the world of uh, the arts, in the world of production, in the world of sports, uh, people are, in uh, my thinking, essentially paid for the number of lives that they touch. If you're a star of a big film and that film is seen by literally hundreds of thousands if not millions of people uh, in the cinema and then subsequently by tens of millions or hundreds of millions over television, even if your compensation is in the range of uh, only pennies per head, uh, you're going to be making lots of money. And uh, that's how I approach that particular issue at this point in time. And it's certainly the argument I make to my own shareholders when we're <laughs> discussing my own compensation every once in a while. Um, <laughs> other than that, Derek, I must say I came in a little late, and uh, I know that you uh, thrive on uh, contention here, and uh, <laughs> all you academics who like to accuse the media of going for the easy jolt per second still prefer when people disagree with each other, I notice at these seminars, and, uh, and I must confess I'm having a heated agreement here, because generally speaking, I've agreed with just about everything everybody has said. <laughs> okay, 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 here, here. We don't, no, you want to fight? Right. Let's, have, let's have a fight. Let's have a fight. Here's the question. Moses? <laughs> this, is a, this, is a, this is a quote Moses. by McLuhan from 1969. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you want to you answer, Moses? Well. Yes, uh, I counted the number of heads here times two pennies, so that's 20 <laughs> times two pennies, so you earn just 40 pennies. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but that's, a truth, that's a truth about teaching, isn't it? That uh, essentially it's uh, very up close and personal, and uh, you don't touch that many lives except by a certain kind of extension, and, uh, and regrettably society pays you accordingly. Right, unless you uh, publish a book like Castells does and uh, be, make it uh, become a bestseller. Right. But 
uh, the discussion here also on earning is that we are amazed that some uh, software companies are earning by giving things away for free. And this, this uh, uh, deserves uh, studying, you know, where browsers are being installed for free and apparently uh, earnings are being derived in a totally different way than we have been used to. Um, people are actually sticking out their necks uh, by giving things away for free. So Ooh. earnings, uh, apart from time and apart from contacts per, per head, uh, earnings by giving things away for free is uh, a subject uh, that is being discussed here too. Well, that, that, that's not actually all that new. And, uh, and of course, somewhere there must be the money. Um, Gillette, as an example, understood years ago that they were not in the razor business, so they essentially give the razors away because they are in the razor blade business. And I think the people who are giving stuff away online are, uh, are, are doing variations of that theme. Well, yeah, I, I think that uh, the point, I think there is no contradiction, was because what Netscape tries to do, or any other software company that gives their product away, tries to do is really get the number of lives touched increased. Right. And uh, so that they can increase the potential for future earnings. Brian Arthur. Once you've got them trapped in your correct. method, then you can begin to, uh, to, to start add the charges. charges. Right. Brian Arthur wrote an excellent book uh, on the law of increasing return. This law applied to, to Microsoft, obviously, with their Windows. Once you are, the bottom line of this law is he who has gets. Because in software business, it's Microsoft who sort of captured most of the operating system, uh, and, and they now can charge as much as they can. But this is not the first occurrence of the law of increasing returns. Obviously, Gillette figured it out. Uh, Sony did not figure it out. Now, VHS is the JVC did. Uh, if you go as far back as 100 years ago, the uh, internal combustion gen engine came out on, in time of the steam engine uh, basically taking most of the market. And they captured the, the, by accident, they captured most of the distribution channels. And we're now all driving the internal combustion engine and you know, uh, screwing up our environment because of what happened 100 years ago. I think there is no contradiction, and I think the intention of the software companies is to get out to as many people as they can. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. So, I, you wanted to pick a fight. I did, wanted to pick a fight, but then I, I heard that you... No, it's not really a fight. I just wanted to read a quote of McLuhan from 1977. The big TV networks, including the CBC, are collapsing by attempting package programming. 19th century style. For the same reason, the same fate is overtaking the bureaucracies and governments of the world. It is an attempt to pursue goals and policies in an instantaneous world of total public involvement. It's kind of interesting, and I wonder what your vision, what is your, what is your response to this idea of the package programming? You're posing a question yeah, to me? Just to explain a bit that, because you created completely new industries and new specialty channels. You have created a whole new job environment there. Well, here I am being congenial again. I, I agree with this point. <laughs> <laughs> Give us some more of that. <laughs> uh, my own response to, um, to the... Uh, previous dominance of package programming has been to engage in a style of television that is uh, uh, essentially live and uh, in the view of people who come from those controlled environments uh, quite anarchic. Um, one of my objectives is to create a flow of television in which the viewer isn't exactly sure what might happen next. and. Uh, and I think uh, offering that choice has uh, met with some success. So uh, I think Marshall was right, and, uh, and our particular response to the proposition has, uh, has found its, its own audience. Um, uh, but, but the truth is, uh, I, I don't know that the world uh, remains uh, comfortably divided, for example, into 
people who just watch uh, the CBC, that's our state broadcaster, all the time, and those who just watch my channels all the time. But, uh, but this, this business of uh, fluid thinking, uh, somebody earlier in the day called it liquid logic, I think uh, applies to, uh, uh, to all our lives. Um, it's, it's not an either or world, really, or at least I find an either or world less interesting. I'm a both and kind of a guy. And, uh, and I think a both and kind of a world is, is precisely the charm of the world that we're in. Here, here, we agree. Uh, let's uh, make it a cultural mix of uh, enjoying and working and studying and learning and watching television and mix those things as free and easy as we can. Indeed. Uh, we do it anyway. I'd love to get a license in the Netherlands. Can you help me? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, actually, uh, we're filming this evening, so if you want to join us. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. All, all you need, um, all you need is about sixty thousand signatures, and you can start uh, uh, your your uh, own broadcasting uh, uh, network here in the Netherlands. Sixty, 60 thousand signatures. Does that yeah. mean any citizen, literally, who can acquire 60,000 signatures? Yeah. Uh, really, yeah. And, and that's then, all? Uh, they'll, they'll, t they'll take your application serious. Yeah. We just had a new uh, uh, channel started uh, with uh, one individual, uh, uh, which is uh, called, what is it, BBC? BNN. In, instead of CNN, he called himself BNN. BNN. And all he got was uh, a license for the coming two, three years based on uh, 60,000 signatures. Uh, and he, uh, he was, yeah. d does, does this license also guarantee him distribution of his signal? Yes. Uh, does anybody get to watch? Uh, yes. 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 On, on yeah. On the state okay. The we'll fly time? over, come to Amsterdam, and we'll discuss it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. I'll be there in the morning. <laughs> okay. All right, that's good. Um, one question regarding, because we're going to have policy issues as well, and that's, uh, that's it. thank you, Moses. Uh, one of the uh, questions that I'd like to address, perhaps, because we'll deal with policy as well, uh, is your view, particularly from a Dutch perception, and you certainly have already alluded to it, but I'll expand a bit on it, on your view of how, what's the responsibility of the government in job creation strategies, as opposed to yeah. the responsibility of business, or as opposed to the responsibility of the people generally, but I guess that's sort of saying a, a truism. Yeah. So you have, you, did okay. you have any uh, immediate response to that, or should we add that? Um, let me ask the question to my colleagues here. Do you have any, any um, immediate response on policy and the roles of government, business, and individuals? If not, we'll uh, prepare ourselves to answer that question tomorrow. That's because a great idea. Eric, I, I think it would be uh, good if we could look forward to tomorrow, set yes. our watches, and discuss uh, during the last few minutes as to what our agenda is for tomorrow. I was going to do just that, yep. Okay. Um, well, go you ahead. Will, you will be presenting to us tomorrow. We'll we'll, we, we'll present you at least one thing, which will be the technology model, because the policy model will be discussed and and created again following. So we and you won't see that one, but we will present you yes the technology model, uh, as we as we see it, and then we would like to know if there are uh, any addition you want to make to your own, because we will be presenting your model at two o'clock at a time when you'll all be asleep. Uh, we'll start presenting it at, uh, well, you won't be asleep then, but at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday, we are presenting the, the technology and the job creation model that is yours and the one we'll present to you tomorrow. This is the first convergent stage of a three-stage operation. Okay. Or four-stage four operation. Okay. Um, now, we were already very happy with the, uh, the early feedback of our uh, presentation. And we'll prepare ourselves as best to give you the feedback tomorrow on the technological thing. The only thing is, we're um, uh, stressed for time tomorrow, more so than today, so because we can start uh, at 2 o'clock. But we do need to, to finish at uh, 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 
3.15 our time. Mm -hmm. So we have a total of one hour and 15 minutes, and then we have to get out of our accommodations here. Okay. <laughs> we'll just make yeah. sure we're right there um, on time, and we start this. And we don't have to go through all the presentation anymore, which is kind, kind of helpful. Um, okay. Now, the other thing is, and we'll, uh, I guess, conclude now, but um, certainly uh, we would like to be able to get back to you after the whole process is done. In other words, we'll, we right. may have to, to organize something where we can tell you what happened with the, ch the Japanese participation later. So we have to think about that. Just to close the uh, session today and to uh, say hello to compatriot, I've asked Peter Eutelinde, the consul, to say a few words. Thank you very much for uh, being here. Thank you, Derek. Uh, as always, it's been uh, very uh, interesting uh, to hear these thoughts in development. Um, I won't go over them because uh, I'm not the, uh, the, the, the best suited to do that, but uh, my presence here is not only because this is an, uh, an interactive uh, uh, session with uh, people in Holland, but also in a way to uh, indicate that even governments uh, know that sometimes you have to change, and my presence here should be seen as a, as a small token of this uh, this idea of uh, change that is necessary. And um, I'd just like to, uh, to, being Dutch, I'm obviously also a parson. So um, I'd just like to, uh, to add a, a word of caution. Um, I usually am very, um, quite suspicious of ideas of presenting uh, organizations in, in, in a, a uh, a broad way. Uh, government should be small, that kind of thing. Um, my guess is you should see every organization as an organization consisting of individuals and you have to influence those individuals. And governments, in my view, uh, should have, if they don't have it already, uh, a position of uh, being there for the general good in the sense that uh, you have a couple of individuals who are paid to uh, do things that aren't, let's say, immediately uh, uh, conducive to revenue um, in order to give ideas that in the first instance don't look uh, very sensible, um, a chance to develop uh, further. And in that sense, uh, my idea would be that governments should uh, join forces with universities as well as the, the private sector to make these changes uh, more possible and uh, ease them into uh, society more easily. Um, but having said uh, my personal piece, um, once again I've uh, been convinced uh, of the, uh, the good um, use of these types of uh, activities uh, both on your end and on this end and uh, I would uh, say up to the 60th anniversary celebration of the living McLuhan and after that uh, many others. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. So to stay within the proper forms, this is a goodbye. I want to thank uh, the, the Consul for having positioned government, at least in those terms, just between the world of art and the world of business, that is in terms of time. Artists have all the time unpaid or otherwise to do what they want. Government a little m less time and business even less so. So time being of the essence, thank you so much for being with us and we meet again this uh, tomorrow morning at uh, hey, uh, <laughs> 8 o'clock. <laughs> ah! All right, so this is goodbye. I have to make it formal. Ciao. <laughs> This is the only way of, of, go, of saying goodbye. <laughs> Otherwise, it goes on forever. Okay. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. I hope you, those who can come back will be back there tomorrow. Um, I want to see if there is there any on anything you would like to add. We'll have a little argument over the role of government, but I think you'll see it friendly in a minute. We'll get to the same goal again. I'll be tomorrow. What is the session tomorrow? Two o'clock? He wasn't there. No, he wasn't there. <laughs> 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 it's, 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 it's so rare. It's, 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 it's 43.
Thanks for lending us with your genius. It has certainly been uh, an addition. What's happening is we will take this, this is video, and we will use it as a presentation to start the finals of the longest uh, connected intelligence workshop, which is happening uh, on the United States tomorrow, starting at two with Charlie at stake. But you have. Oh, where? Uh, at the 43 Green uh, Park. No video conference, but they need video, um, video, VHS. Uh -huh. Oh, playback, playback only. Thank <laughs> you. 